good evening. Starting a couple of minutes early, some of you I know uh, are ready uh, even before seven o'clock. So if some of you tune in a little bit later, you can always uh, rewind a couple of minutes and, and catch back up. Uh, looking forward to studying with you. I uh, want to introduce, if you've looked at the title already, All Souls Matter, I want to uh, delve into and, and uh, explore some things that are on the hearts of so many of us. If you've had news on it all or read news, you know uh, about rioting, you know about racial discord that uh, seems to uh, uh, crop up its ugly head every every few years. There'll be some uh, incident that will spark uh, renewed uh, this protest and things like that. And I want us to, to think seriously, think biblically about these matters. So uh, I want to spend some time with you thinking about that. It'll go beyond tonight. I don't plan to cover everything. Nothing can be said in just one lesson, obviously. And I also want you to know that uh, our leadership, we had a good meeting last night, elders uh, and preachers. Uh, we talked about some of the things going on, different perspectives. Uh, I assure you our elders are concerned about certainly from a brotherhood perspective and a congregational perspective, uh, not just appearances, not platitudes, but uh, certainly being right with God. And some things are happening in society that I think are driving home uh, just issues and, and ways of thinking that maybe we haven't done before. So pray that there's a renewed uh, exploration, certainly from a biblical perspective of our respect, certainly for human life, dignity of all, uh, that's the big umbrella in which the, some of the subpoints we'll be thinking about the next few weeks fall under. So uh, uh, there will be some lessons, by the way, coming up in July, certainly Sunday mornings in July. Uh, along that theme as well, uh, we want to, to realize again this is a Bible topic. This is at the very heart of what it is uh, to be a child of God, to think about our place in view of our Creator. Sometimes we've maybe thought of this as just a kind of a passing fad or just a fringe element. I guarantee you uh, from the perspective that we'll look at tonight, we will be reminded it is not. This is part and parcel of who we are. Let's talk about perspective a moment. A lot of things make us unique. All of us have a perspective. No one really shares my perspective. Okay. I want to say about that too, that my perspective is changing and has changed. As I think about my life, what I saw valuable at 20 was different than at 30. Uh, marriage and having a, a couple of children will do that. Uh, getting some maturity and, and so in, into my 40s. Different perspective, 50s, yes. And so as a 56-year-old white male, conservative, uh, I have a viewpoint. There are many others that uh, share some of the, the same viewpoints I have that are my age but also very different from me. Some younger, some older, uh, some same skin color I have, some not, some living in America, some living in foreign countries. But, but all of us have a perspective. And our perspective is hard for us to step out of ourselves and truly, uh, I guess, think about what life is like on the other side. And one of the painful things I think for all of us to do is to examine the idea, can I be wrong? Uh, have I been racist? Have I discriminated against people, not necessarily of a different skin color, but maybe economic background or nationality? Uh, any number of things. Prejudice is the ink with which all human history is written, said Mark Twain. We know that to be true. Uh, we've seen that with our eyes. And so thinking about how others view life or some of the perspectives they have on even the death of George Floyd. Now, Let's think about that for a moment. Can I ask you this question? What is the black position on George Floyd's death? That is, what is what, what do black people think about that? Now, some of you already are ahead of me. Well, it depends on which black person you talk to. Well, some, I guess all of them would say it was an atrocity. It was a shame. It was murder. No defense for it at all. And But, but beyond that, it's the idea, well, I think riots are are definitely appropriate and anything and everything that's been done is okay. And others would say, I deplore the same violence and the looting and other sins uh, that were of the same order as the sin of taking George Floyd's life. And so you can't say, well, there's a, there's a universal position by black people on that. What's the white position on that? There again, look at all the different perspectives that mirror and really run the whole gamut from folks of all skin colors and, and how they view those things. 
And so note there's no one universal perspective, is there? And so what we want to do is be fair. I cannot relate to a 22-year-old Hispanic female living in California. I can't relate to what it's like being a 78-year-old a black man in Detroit. And, and they can't really know my perspective, but they have a perspective. And beyond even our perspective, I don't want to elevate that as to the end-all, be-all of, of what I think is the most important. My perspective needs to be framed and informed by the Word of God the doctrines that relate to sanctity of life and, and all of that. So as we think about why there is discord, why there's been strife, this is not a modern problem. This is something that cropped up a century and a half ago, two, uh, two or three centuries ago. No, division is an ancient problem. Uh, you, you look at your Old Testament, you see slavery back in the book of Genesis. And again, it wasn't... Uh, dark-skinned people being enslaved by white or Caucasians. Slavery is an ancient problem. And some of the things in our own country, uh, our recent history and our ancient history, uh, which is short compared to other nations, uh, we can see threads of what's happened long ago, all the way back in the Old Testament there. And so Satan is a divider, God is a uniter. And our perspective as Christians, regardless of our skin color, is going to be pretty similar as we filter these things through the lens of what's God's perspective on this. God has given us tools to support others, to get along, to be united. Satan doesn't have those tools. All of that is in his bag is to destroy and to tear down and things like that. Uh, think about the difference in the variety in life. We're a few months away from fall, but many of us enjoy autumn because we get to see all the different colors. Uh, summer is kind of bathed in green, and you think of winter, we don't get much snow, so not a lot of white, but it's kind of grays, uh, not, not much to it, but, but fall is beautiful. And you don't think about only one color, is it orange, is it brown, is it yellow, uh, is it the red in the trees? No, it's the blending of those, and so in a similar way, God, who is a God of variety, has given us different tones, hues, colors even of skin, different likes and dislikes, strengths that transcend all races, all ages, both genders. And all these things are not again to divide us or to make us fragmented or separated into uh, the different traits we have, but to unite us there. What color is God? He's got a white God. He's got a black God. Is there a Hispanic God and a, an Oriental God? There's one God. Let me take us to Acts chapter 17. We're going to hear Paul preaching in the city of Athens. He's up at Mars Hill, which is the Areopagus. There are learned philosophers, smart men, as, as at least they would regard themselves, all spending time debating the issues of the day, uh, wanting to tell and hear some new thing, as uh, the Bible indicates there. Paul comes into town, and Paul sees the city lined with, dotted with idols everywhere. Athens at that time was notorious for being a very idolatrous city. One said, a historian, it's easier to find a god, little g, than a man in Athens. And so Paul starts at their being worshipful or religious. He's actually trying to find some common ground. But he's presenting to them the notion of one god, not many, not a multitude, one God. And I want you to hear in part what he says about this God, Acts 17, 26. And he, God, has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwelling, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him. He's not far from any of us, or each of us, in him we live and move and have our being. Now, you could break that down phrase by phrase, in fact, even key in on some words, but here's my purpose for looking at that section of Paul's great sermon. Paul said that God is made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. Did he acknowledge there were different nations? Yes. I don't know if uh, there was a, a way of, of reckoning different appearances or things. I, I wouldn't be surprised by that 2,000 years ago. I'm sure there were dark-skinned people. Uh, those living in China, as we think of it now, probably uh, might have had slanted eyes and things like that. And so traits, 
uh, that all of them go back to Adam and Eve, God's creation in the beginning. I think that many, not just in the last couple of centuries, but I guess all through the ages, feel like that maybe one race is the favored race. Some black-skinned people may think they are the favored race, and others lighter than them are inferior, and vice versa. We know that many white-skinned have thought that uh, darker-skinned people uh, were inferior. There's some interesting things from the Bible and, and some, uh, well, proofs that really aren't proofs. They're kind of uh, contorted attempts to try to make the Bible teach something. I've heard about the curse of Ham. Uh, going back to the, the sons of Noah and supposedly through Canaan, uh, there's a curse on dark-skinned people that cannot be borne out by history or certainly the Bible at all. But it's the idea that we're all from God. If I think about any person, any human being, as being substandard, inferior, uh, maybe somehow they descended from um, primates or something, but the rest of us were created by God. That's a foreign concept. There's something fundamentally wrong with that thinking. And so God is colorblind. God isn't a white God or a black God or a purple or green or anything else. Who does God favor? We think about that in the sense of people favoring parents, but let's think about it in another sense. Does God favor one race, one skin color, one uh, socioeconomic background over another? Not if you read the Bible. Let me go back to Acts 17. Let's look in 30 and 31. When Paul gets toward the end of his sermon, and he throws Jesus in there, uh, certainly because he's trying to get them around to the idea of a concept of number one, one true God, but also a judgment by the man that he's uh, ordained. At this point, he gets interrupted just right after the verses we'll read in a moment. Some are mocking him. They think he's crazy. They... Cast an aspersion on him. They say he's a seed picker. Probably a technical term back then that says, you know what, you're just, uh, you're a lightweight intellectually. Uh, nothing you're saying is really making sense there. But here's what Paul says, truly these times of ignorance. And by there, I need to stop and, and insert the ignorance about thinking that, that God is shaped by art or man's devising. We need to write and proper concept of God before I could ever look at myself or others uh, uh, in that framework. It says, God's overlooked this. He's winked at it, New King, or King James, but he now commands all men everywhere. Who does he command? Everybody, everywhere, all nations, to repent, to change your mind. Why? Because he's appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he's ordained, and he's given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. God, who do you want to be saved? Everybody. That great distinction, in, as in Romans chapter 3, the Jew first, and also the Greek, and see that in Romans 1, 16, 17, the Jew first and also the Greek. The Jews representing God's chosen people in the Old Testament. The Greeks, not just people living in Greece, but the pagan, anyone who is non-Jewish, the Gentiles, if you will. You know, most of you watching have Gentile blood in you. Okay, maybe some that, that are full blood Jew. There may be some that have a little bit of Jewish blood, but but really doesn't matter, scripturally speaking and, and uh, religiously. What matters is being a member of God's body, the church. And so when you look in Ephesians, for example, at at God in one body, the church, reconciling all nations, all different backgrounds. Is there room for Jews? And Gentiles in the kingdom, absolutely. Well, which one is, is class A and which one's class B? Paul says, grounds level at the foot of the cross. Don't Jews, Romans 11, 12, 13, have some advantages? Yes. To them, we're given the oracles of God. But no, it's not that God is saying, you know what? I'm going to make it easier for the Jews. Nor did he say, I'm going to make it harder. And I'm getting around to all this to say, when I look at people, when I look at human beings, regardless of what their background is, what language they speak, I need to see those created in the image of God, Genesis 1, 26. Everyone created in the image of God. If that's true, what right would I have to look down uh, on someone else to think, and maybe in universal terms say, all of them, all of those people, 
aren't smart, they're not talented, they're whatever. I have no right to do that. These are people created in the image of God. And so we, like former generations, have been guilty of some prejudices. I guess we still are. What I'm simply striving to do personally and encourage others to, to think about as well is to strip every vestige of disdain in my heart for someone else on the basis of my upbringing or social conditions or history or whatever it is and simply get back to square one of how does God view people? And if he views people as valuable,